So without further ado, I will hand over to the first speaker. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. Thank you. We want to thank the Lord for, for, for having brought us to the house so that we may, we may be enriched and learn more about him as we prepare for his soon coming. Okay, so does anyone remember what, are, what was our, 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 our strategic goals for the last five years? I know it was extended, but what was, what we, what was, the, the, mish, what was the goal, by the way? What were the goals, by the way? Just in, there were three point, there was a one-liner, then there were three point forms that we were talking about. Does anyone remember? Were we involved in that strategic uh, implementation as a church? Okay, I'll remind you, it was reach out, reaching out, reach out or reaching out. And it, so we had reaching out, reaching upwards, reaching across, and reach out does does it ring a bell yeah it was something like that so what was supposed to happen as a church is we we're supposed to come up with initiatives that will address all those all those all those all those goals as a church i need i don't know if if any of us were involved in that this year this year does who knows what the the goals the strategic goals for this year are for the next five years GC session happened a few, a few weeks, months, a month ago or something. Does anyone remember what our goals are as a church? It's very, as we're trying to remember, it's very important for us to know that because I know if you are joining a company, you have to know what are the goals of that company and it, so that you align yourself in whatever you are doing with the goals of that company so that you keep yourself what? relevant. I it. There are some roles when the company was restructuring, some people were told, no, you are no longer relevant in the company. I it. So we are saying, what's our goal for the church as we are going forward in the next five years? What's the statement that we always use? Okay. I will go. I it. And it's got three pillars. It's got three pillars. Because of time, I'm going to tell you it's mission-driven, spirit-led, and what else? Leadership growth. Thank you very much. And leadership growth. Those are the three. So I'm going to talk about the first one, which is mission-driven, which, which is close to, to my heart. Hang it. Which is close to my heart. I'll just read what they have here and then we can try and so what I want us to be thinking about is in mission driven, how what what have we done as a church and what can we do as a church? What are we doing as a church? Or what can we do as a church? Or how can we improve what we have been doing as a church? I need. So it says to revive the concept of of Golden Harvest, SDA church mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving every member young and old in the joy of witnessing for Christ and making disciples. It's simple enough, ain't it? So what I want you to do now as a church is try and think of how many departments do we have as a, as a church? There are men, ain't it? What do you think, I don't want to restrict, restrict you to one particular department, what do you think we can do as a church in order for us to accomplish what this goal of mission driven that we've just spoken about. What do you think as a church? Omamu is going to say something on health. Who else can speak on something else? Uh, I happen to know some of you and my finger can happen to point at you so you can't run away from this one. What do you think we can do as a church? It. What do you think we can do as a church to be in order for us to be, to be a mission-driven church? To be a mission-driven church. 
I was preaching Vespers, but I don't want to do it now. I was, let's discuss. There's no wrong answer. This is your church. It's not, it's not it is in as much as it, it has brought this thing down to us, but you have to speak about what applies to us and what you think applies to us. and what you Because this is your church as well, and it, you should do what you can do as a church so that we are able to accomplish this mission. Anyone else? It's not a trick question. Uguting is a puma leni answer. puma a puma from Mars or heaven. Puyela from heaven yesterday. No, it's not a trick question. What do you think as a church we can do so that we can be a mission-driven church? Mission-driven church. Mission-driven church. Eden. We can open a school. We can open a school. And by the way, this was, thank you, Eden, may the Lord bless you. By the way, this was on our strategic plan for, last, for, the, last, for the last five years. We can open a school. How do we benefit from opening a school? We sing Ababamba, we say, while they are still young and groom them, teach, teach them while they are still young. They grow to know Christ. You can have, the Roman Catholic says, give me your child when they are still how many years? From zero to how many years? To seven years. After that, they will never leave the church. So, that's another goal. And it, because by now, if you try, Uti, you come and witness to me, already I'm saying, I'm ideology, I'm I already know what I want in life. But a child does not know what they want. Once you teach them while they are young, they grow with that thing. I don't have time. Does anyone have anything else? Okay. Dr. Maso. Yes. Thank you very much. Did you hear that? So where would that fit in? Where would that fit in? Within the youth cluster. And, it, and, and uh, last week, with the other time when the youth are always saying, Guti, you know, the church is not, bring, is not giving us, is not pre presenting these things to us, programs that are interesting. But you realize that as a youth, we are the ones who are supposed to bring those things up front so that we can initiate those things. Because the church, majority of the church right now, it's the youth. Therefore, we are supposed to be holding youth efforts. And youth effort that is being held by the older people is not supposed to be as interesting as ours, as the youth one. And it, sister with health. I'm now putting it in people's mouths. I need health. Thank you. Thank you. So what's supposed to happen is, as, as we are having those church business meetings that we, most of us don't attend, we're supposed to be hearing, whenever youth is bringing their program, we're supposed to see mission-driven. We're supposed to see mission-driven. We're supposed to see spirit-led. We're supposed to see leadership growth within those programs. When we talk about health, you realize that you can reach out to, person, to a person by, in, in the health area. You can reach out to them in that health area. So it, it calls us to be involved as a church. And we can do much better. It's, the church has is, is, is shifted, sort of. So we now need to come up with more initiatives that are better than what we used to know, like before COVID. The church has changed now. Let me read to you some, 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 some quotations that I got. This is the quotation that I got um, as, I was, as, as I was preparing. It says, God calls for men to give 
the message of warning to the world that is asleep deep in, trans, in trespasses and sin. He calls for free will offerings from those who, whose hearts are in the work, who have a burden for the soul, that they shall not perish but have everlasting life. Satan is playing the game of life for the souls of men. He is seeking to secure means that he may bind it up so that it shall not be used to advance the mission enterprises. Shall we be ignorant of his devices? Shall we allow him to... to, to I, I think Liaguzo, Satan is busy working out ways and it in, in order to stop this mission. And he's doing very well even on the media. So we need also to invest. If you can't go, then your money can go. I need to do that mission. And then the last one that I would like to read, it says, so th for, those, for those who cannot go, then your resources, but there is no reason for not participating in all this. It says those who are truly converted are called to do a work which requires money and concentration. The obligation which binds us to place our name on the church role holds us up responsible to work to the uttermost of our ability for God. He calls for undivided service for the entire devotion of the heart, soul, and mind. So he's calling, Gumana, the reason, the, the, for the fact you you register to be a member of the church, there is, you are supposed, you are obliged to allow it. Because that's the mission of, that's the reason why you joined the church. The church is mission driven. Therefore, you are supposed to partake in whatever the church calls for as far as mission is concerned. May I see in closing, all those who have registered for any ministry, any ministry, for any ministry that you've registered for. Let's see by the show. I want how few we are as Jaja and it, but I want how few we are. So when the Lord comes, He says, I was hungry and you never fed me. I was in prison and you never what? You never came to visit me. What happens is the church has got means by which you can accomplish that. You cannot do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. But the church has got means by which you can be able to, to accomplish these, these, these missions. So we are delaying the Lord's coming. That Second Peter chapter, Second Peter chapter three, verse eight to nine. And it, oh, what is the Lord? The reason why the Lord is delaying, it's not because of His lack. It's not the Lord is not slack and concerning His what His promises. He's not willing that any should perish. And it, so let's go out there and work for Christ. Let's be a church-driven, church mission-driven, church what? Mission, let's be a mission driven church. I wanted to see if you are listening. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. What does the church say? Okay, we, we need to be mission driven. But for us to be mission driven, we also need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit, and we also need our leadership to be, uh, to have grown. So, so, so this. This, this one, these young ones are also leaders in growth. Leaders in growth. So, so what the church realized that um, a lot of young people, as soon as they grow a certain age, they are out of the church. So now, so, so that's why we need pillars uh, two and three. When we, are led by, when we are led by the Spirit, and we are intentional about growing leadership within the church, then we are able to go. We are able to, to go for our mission. We are able to go for our mission. So uh, I'm looking at, two, uh, at the second and third goals, uh, which are spirit-led and leadership growth. Now, uh, I was one of the fortunate people when this church was being built um, who happened to see the pillars. So before the structure was put, there were pillars. So if you, if you look here, there, there um, even outside and that side and by the door, there are pillars. And these pillars are holding the structure, the pillars. So, so as the strategic committee, we are coming saying, we want to have these three pillars. And these three pillars are mission-driven, 
spirit-led and leadership growth. Mission-driven, spirit-led and leadership growth. These three pillars to hold um, our aspirations for the next five years. So, now, spirit-led. Um, John chapter 14, verses 16. John chapter 14, uh, spirit-filled, spirit spirit-filled. Uh, spirit led. John chapter 14 uh, verses 16 to 17. It says, and I will pray the Father, this is Jesus praying, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be, with, will be in you. So we are talking about the Holy Spirit. That, oh, yes, we, 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 want to, we want to go for mission, but if we are not led by the Spirit, we won't be able to, to achieve anything. So that's why Christ then says, I'll pray the Father that he gives you the Holy Spirit. Now, if we then go to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Um, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive what? When what? When the Holy Spirit has what? Has come upon you. So, so, and these are promises. So, so this is what we are talking about. When you are talking about spirit-led, the, um, the last verse, which is also another promise from from Jesus, um, Luke chapter 11, verse 13. And may this be a prayer for each and every one of us. He says, um, the context, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? This is chapter 11, verse 11 of Luke. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? So this is for us to think. Now, the key text, verse 13, it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? How much more? So, so the Holy Spirit has been availed to us. And it is for us to ask. As, as, as much as uh, Mrs. Mkandla here, when Eden asks for an egg, she does not look for a scorpion to give her own child, but she looks for that egg and she gives her daughter. And this is what Christ is likening to. See, our Father, who has got the best interest for us, um, he is ready and willing and waiting to pour out the Holy Spirit unto us. So this is the second, the second goal, the second pillar. The first pillar is what? The mission driven. And the second one is what? Spirit led. Okay. Now, the third one, the third one is what? Leadership growth. Okay. So leadership growth. Um, let's look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 12. There is a, a phrase that I want when we are talking about leadership. Uh, there is a phrase that, that I want from that verse. Um, it says, uh, so this, this verse is speaking particularly to the youth. It says what? Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And, and, the, part that, and the part that I want um, for everyone to be applicable to everyone is that be an example. Be a what? So we are, we are saying um, for the, the elderly who are in us, who are in leadership positions, let's be an example to the younger ones. Let us be an example. Let us mentor 
the ones who are coming up. But at the same time, th this verse was also speaking specifically to the young people. It says, let no one despise your youth and be an example. So even young people, be a what? Be an example. Be an example in what? Be an example in your conduct. Be an example in your giving. Be an example in your what? In, in, your give, in your spirit. So be an example in everything that we do. So, so in whatever we are going to do, we are going to try to make sure that we are upskilling each other, we are mentoring each other so that we all grow. So when we all grow in Christ and when we are led by the spirit, then we are then able to go for a mission so that we can say all of us, I will go. So these are our pillars. Number one is what? Mission, mission driven. Number two, spirit led. And number three, leadership growth. And may God continue to bless us as we worship together. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. What does the church say to such a lovely Sabbath school presentation? Amen. Amen. Thank you to the strategic committee. And welcome to all the visitors who have joined us today. Can we ask you to stand up? Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, before we separate for our classes, we do have a few announcements. Firstly, today we are on lesson number five, and is there anyone who can recite the memory verse for us? You can raise your hand or come up. Okay. Come on. Anyone else? Ephesians 3 verse 20. It says he is able to do immeasurable things than you ask or imagine. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, Ephesians 3 verse 20. He is able to do more than you ask or imagine. Amen. Amen. Here you go. Samuel continued as is he right all the day he life. Amen. Here you go. What does the church say? Amen. Amen. Today is the end of July, so we're going to take this time to celebrate all our July babies and anniversaries. Can we ask all those who are born in July or had um, anniversaries in July to stand up and Elder Zunemi will come pray for us? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning. We want to thank you for the gift of life. We want to thank you for these babies that you have allowed yet to see another year in a world that is crippled with many diseases, world that is crippled with a lot that is going on. You have given them another chance. I believe, Heavenly Father, it's a chance that they reconnect with you where they have lost let them reconnect with you thank you father for your blessings that continue to come 
upon our lives. We pray for a special blessing upon their lives. Bless them spiritually. Bless them financially. Meet them at their point of needs. You know their individual needs and wants. We are grateful for hearing our prayer this morning. We pray and ask all this through Christ who died for our sins. Amen. Okay, we're now going to separate in the classes. We have the Chewa, Shona, and the Zulu class outside. The baptismal class is in the first tree. The children's classes are outside, and the English class will be inside. I'll ask the choristers to give us our last song. Mai kilong oli kalang esi kati sedula kofi gausu olu minjalo abasindi siwe yo eswe ni vaso butana baby swape zulungi zoba kona masebe biswape zulu. Happy Sabbath Church. So to, before we start our lesson, may we pray. Our Father in heaven, we would like to thank you for the Sabbath you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for taking us throughout the week. You've protected us. You've allowed us to be here this morning. May you please be with us as we're going to be going through the lesson. May you help us so that we may learn what you want us to learn, reveal everything you want to be revealed, and may you work in our hearts so that our hearts may be changed and everything we learn is actually applied in our lives. This humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we are on lesson five. We're on lesson five. Does anyone know what the topic for lesson five is? Does anyone know what the topic for lesson five is? Okay, extreme heat. So we're talking about extreme heat in lesson five. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically go through a run through, a summary of the lesson, and then I'm going to take it to the floor so that each one of us can contribute what we've learned in the lesson. So with the question of extreme heat, we're actually just going through a continuation of what we've been going through this quarter, which is talking about crucibles. And with extreme heat, it's taking it up a notch. So if we thought that the lessons we had before were situations where life was hard, now it's telling us, no, it, it, it's not as hard as we actually, it, it can be. It can be notched up to get to the point where we've got extreme heat. And our memory text for this week's lesson is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, which said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him into grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, 
he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So in our intro, we go on to talk about a text that was written by C.S. Lewis uh, just after, I think it was just after his wife passed away or it was just before she passed away. And he talks about how in his experience, he's, he's thinking about God and everything that's going on through life. And he then says that, you know, the worst thing that can possibly happen from the situation is not me coming out of the situation and believing that there is no God. The worst possible outcome of the ordeal he'd gone through with the experience with his wife was that he would come out of the experience believing that God was a harsh God and that God was an evil God. God was a bully. And we see that this is, this is basically the, the take that the devil has been using since the beginning. The take that God is not just, God is a bully, and God only protects us when we, we, we know that we're going to only listen to him because he protects us. And if we don't listen to him, he's just going to punish, punish us very harshly. So our lesson then goes to talk about We've got two different examples. So the first example, we see there's this example of the prophet Hosea, where God actively tells him to go marry a prostitute. And God already tells him that, yeah, when you marry her, she's going to go out, have children outside and everything, but keep going, get her to come back home. And this is an example that God is giving to the children of Israel, where he's basically telling them that, you know what, in everything that's happening, you guys keep on leaving me, going to other gods and going to do other things that have nothing to do with me. But what you don't realize is the things you're going out to look for are things I've been providing for you. So there's, there's a mention of clothing, there's a mention of wine, there's a mention of many things that the husband has been doing for the wife. But the wife is saying, I'm going to go out and see my many lovers who will provide these things for me, these things that I'm looking for. And then God says, a time is going to come where I'm going to remove it. And when I remove it, you will then come to understand that actually it was not me going out that was providing all these things. I was taking things for granted that I was actually getting from my husband. You know, in the world, it, they tell us that we usually appreciate things when they're taken away from us. So before you have it, you appreciate it, but it's probably about 70%. While you have it, the appreciation drops because you start taking it for granted, and it's just normal life. Then once it's taken away, and now you've got an example where you sit down and you think, actually, I did not appreciate this thing as much as... I should have appreciated it. So that's the example that's given with the experience for Hosea. So then um, a couple of questions come from that example where some people might see it very harsh for God to come and take one person to go through this ordeal because he's even told that um, the things that are going to be happening from outside are going to be permanent things. So it's, it tells us that all the children are going to be from outside the marriage, from different men. And when he goes out to get the wife and for her to come back, he's not only getting her, she's going to come with the children as well. And he's going to have to take care of those children. And when she goes out, it just keeps on going. So personally, when, when, when I read the story and I looked at it, I, I was a bit puzzled regarding that story because... It's, it's, it, it seems a bit extreme in how it's presented. And then, after the story of Hosea, we then get the story of, there's a mention of Abraham. We've got Abraham, and in Abraham's experience, we are told about how Abraham was then asked to kill his son, or sacrifice his son to the Lord. And an interesting text that's written there is that um, Ellen White says that God waited until Abraham was of old age and all Abraham was now looking forward to was resting. 
He was old. All he wanted to do was to rest. And then there's this test that comes through. And Abraham is told by God, you, um, you know what? I'd like you to sacrifice the son I gave you. Besides all of the things that Abraham had seen God doing for him and everything and all the inheritance he'd been promised that, no, you know what? Your children shall be across the world. You'll have many descendants and everything. And now in his old age, all he's thinking about is rest now. He gets the biggest test of his life. But praise God because Abraham managed to pass that test. And things went well for him. And we've got an example in Abraham about how we can take our lives and the problems that come through and God refines our character going through those. And then the last one was the mention of Job and Job's story. And the lesson goes into talking about how it looks like God enticed everything that happened in Job's life because God knew what asking the devil would end up being getting to. But you also then see God's grace in he told the devil to go so far, but not too far. And at the end of the day, we see that things went well for Job. For Job. And in Job's story, it's an interesting one because we usually believe that we go through crucibles and we go through these problems for God to refine our character and to remove sin. But in Job's case, the book already starts telling us that in the land of Uz, there was a blameless and upright man. And then God says, have you seen my servant Job? And God also affirms that Job was blameless and upright. But Job still has to go through this ordeal. But praise God as well because Job managed to go through the ordeal. He did not curse God or anything. And at the end of the day, God rewarded him. Not to say that God is going to just reward us because we've gone through these things. But when, when, when all is said and done, and uh, First Corinthians it then talks about, it's best for us not to judge things before their time because we do not know what's going on right now. But at the appointed time, we're going to get the opportunity to see and ask God, Lord, I went through this. Why did I go through it? And when God reveals everything and we see the whole picture it says that we will all praise god so that is our lesson in that is basically how our lesson was going so if anyone had not read the lesson uh, i'm hoping the summary has helped you to get to, to to get to an understanding of what we're going to be talking about this morning so now going back to the beginning it talks, um, we're, talking about, we're talking about Abraham and his crucible, the story in Genesis chapter 22. An interesting question is posed here. It says, um, why did God ask Abraham to offer this sacrifice? If God knows everything, what's the point? So I would like to pose this question to us. Why did God let Abraham go through all of this when God already knows what was the point of that happening? Okay, so we have a hand. May you please get a mic to Mr. Chingono? Thank you, Bradley. <clears throat> I think um, I'll probably start uh, before your question and um, um, try to get deeper into what C.S. Lewis said. You see. Uh, he says that uh, when his wife was about to die, so he says that uh, I'm not in danger of saying that God does not exist, but I am in danger of saying that this is what God looks like. So I think that is the extreme here that we face in our lives. You know, just imagine a situation um, where your son is very ill 
and there's no help. Um, you just, you know, your, 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 your dilemma is not whether God is there or not. You see, sometimes for us, it, it has to do like, so God has allowed this. You see, uh, we can have, a, you know, you don't really ask yourself questions on whether it is the devil who's bringing this temptation to you, or it is God. Was if it is happening to you, then God has allowed it. You see, so then you say that surely God has signed off. You know, when someone wants to do something at work, uh, even if it's a subordinate, they come to someone who's senior to sign off. And when the senior signed off, then it means that you have authorized it. So when these very bad things, the extreme heat happens in our lives, you know, the danger is that we just see like, okay, so God has allowed this to happen in my life. So this is what God is. Because God cannot separate himself from the work that he has done. So that, that, that is the major dilemma that we have. And I think that's where probably Abraham also is being put in a situation where uh, he has to be here with uh, God's instruction to uh, have his son crucified. So the experience of Abraham is uh, also very excruciatingly painful in the sense that uh, the, pra the practice of uh, sacrificing children was uh, amongst the heathen that were around Abraham. And Abraham had, had always seen God as a, as a righteous God. But now God gives him a son. Uh, before Abraham he didn't have a son. So he was not in, in that practice and it was impossible for him to do it. But God now gives him a son and then asks him to indulge in those practices again. So he, uh, the way he's seeing God now is also different now. So is this the God <laughs> who I worship? He, he gives me a son. I didn't have a son. He gives me a son so that I may practice the same practices that he, he abhors. You see? So this is the, 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 the crucible uh, where the heat is being increased against Abraham. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for the comment. Do we have other comments at the moment? Okay. Um, oh, okay, so there's a uh, hand to the side. Uh, whilst the mic is coming to a... Uh, it's, it's a very interesting thing that God would risk, or it's, it looks like God would risk us misunderstanding him when we are going through these things. So the example has been given of Abraham, where God has told him that I want you to be separate, and I want you to live a certain way. And then after all these promises, God then tells him to do the things that Abraham is, look, is, is, is seeing around him, God then tells him to do exactly that same thing as a test. So even, even with the test, I'm sure it's not just, it wasn't just a test for Abraham, also the people who were around him looking at what had happened were, were also questioning what, what type of God is this? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I think what I found interesting about this is uh, coming from what Rechigono was saying, is that C.S. Lewis was actually watching his wife dying. And then what, what he came up to is that, um, so this is how God is. You know? So saying this is how God is, he was saying God will allow such things to happen to you. And that actually did not distract him from his own journey. What I'm trying to say is that there is a saying which goes, a problem shared, it's a problem halved. But it's not like in this instance where we're talking about crucibles. There's nothing like a crucible shared, it's a crucible halved. It's your own crucible, you've got to carry it yourself. And as you carry it yourself, others who are watching you can actually sympathize. But they will also experience their own crucibles. So what, 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 what makes me raise my hand, basically, is that, is that as, we, as we move along with our own crucibles, it's because we, we find ourselves in a situation like this. I found myself saying to Dr. Masuku outside, he asked me a question, won't there, have, won't there be a question where you ask God, how can you do this? How, how can you say you are a loving God? 
And then I said to him, fortunately, I'm not sure if I'm deceiving myself, but fortunately, when I find myself in such situation where it's bad, it's painful, it's, it's sad, it's, it's all of those, like I have arthritis and when the pain is there, I don't say, where are you, God? I actually say to myself, how is it that I can not be having this when I'm in a world which is like this messy? You know, the world is messy. There is a whole lot of sin surrounding me. How mean can I be this one person who is so clean and pure? So I'm in this situation because of where I find myself in. But as I find myself in this, God is actually purifying me so that, I, so that that which spoils me to have the problem that I'm having is actually cleansed. And then I become like Christ himself. So that's how I was taking it. But the most important thing is that crucibles are not shed. They are personal. Okay. Um, thank you. There's, there's a hand at the back, and then we'll have a hand here. So while, while, while she was talking, um, I, I, I had an interesting thought where she's talked about how crucibles uh, are not shared. As much as we might try share problems, um, we each have to go through it alone, and how we go through it is going to be different. And it got me thinking about, they mentioned Job in the... In the, in the lesson, and we see that Job went through all these things, and we, we, I'm sure we've all heard the story of Job over and over and over again. Uh, but an interesting thing I was thinking about was that, so in this whole ordeal, we've got Job, we've got God, we've got Satan, but we also forget that there's another character who went through ex almost exactly the same things Job went through, and that's his wife. Because her children also died. When everything, when everything went haywire, she was also there experiencing it. And we, 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 we get to a point where she then goes to her husband and she says, you know what? With all these things that are happening, just curse God and die. And a lot of the time we look at that statement and we think that... Um, Job's wife, I, I don't know, people have different, different stances on it, but when, when I'm looking at it, it's probably a situation where she sees everything she loves is taken away. And the one remaining, one remaining person on earth who she loves is going through this crazy ordeal. And she's like, you know what, um, I'd rather you die than see you going through all of this. That's, that's, that's just throwing a span into the works. I think uh, for me, uh, Happy Sabbath, three days traveling to, to sacrifice his son was the most painful part than the act of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, slaying his own. But what um, then comforts me is he had three days to reflect, three days to thank God, three days to worship God. Because before the gift was given, this is the same Abraham who prayed to God that I am in, I'm, you gave me a promise. I'm old, where is the promise? And God sees through his promise. So, so, so at the when the promise is given, I don't see any crucible in Abraham because God was able to deliver the promise in his old age. The same God, let's assume here they allowed this thing to, uh, to play out. The same God was able to deliver Abraham from the entire, um, if we call it a, 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 a crucible. From this side, we, we, we can call it a crucible. But I don't think we, we, can, we, we can say to Abraham, he went through a crucible considering what God did to him. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, we, we heard it posed that he, he doesn't think that Abraham went through the 
through a crucible. Uh, so after Elder Chagarisa, may we please have it here. And also uh, another interesting thing about Abraham's story is that God promised him from a very long time before that I am going to make you a father of many nations. And then we get to Genesis 16. It's probably about 20 years into this promise that keeps on coming. And Sarah, the wife, well, I think she was still Sarai there, says, um, you know what, with this promise, God is going to deliver, but me and you are of old age, and I, I can't have children anymore. And she devised a plan. Ishmael was born. And in Genesis 17, something interesting happens, where God, God told him, you know what, send, send Ishmael away. And then God then tells Abraham that um, actually between me and your descendants, covenant, you're going to get circumcised. And this is God basically saying, the tools you think you're going to use to get you children, remove, and I, God, in my power, am still going to come through for you when everything else is gone and you do not, you do not see how it is possible for you to have children old age, all the powers are gone, and then Isaac comes through. So seeing all of this that has, that has happened before, was it really a crucible? Or Abraham knew that, you know what, this God gave me the son when it was impossible for me to get a son, so he's just going to resurrect him. Hold on. Uh, I'm not sure which question to respond to because I've just said interesting uh, comments now. Uh, but, but anyway, I wanted to, to go to the last three questions on the same page. Uh, they do raise uh, very interesting thoughts there. So the author says, how do you know the voice of God? How do you know when God is talking to you? What are the ways he communicates his will to you? I think this is a very, very... Uh, important uh, point of reflection. Um, I, I think the other speakers were, were quite correct that uh, uh, this, <laughs> this, this was not easy uh, by, by whatever criteria that you want to measure it. It must have been very difficult for Abraham. Uh, the example that we gave now where they connive with their wife to try and help God uh, to fulfill what he has promised it just shows the human side of, of Abraham. That indeed he was human. He was prone to, 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 to fall, just like all of us. But there's, 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 there's certain element of faith that comes through uh, when you look at the story of Abraham. In particular, uh, with, with the three-day journey that has been mentioned, uh, to go and perform an instruction that is contrary to God's commandment itself. So that's why I pointed to those, those three questions, to say sometimes the, the requirements which God may have upon ourselves may not make sense to us. They, in fact, they don't have to make sense. That is why I pointed to those three questions, to say, how are we able to know that this is God talking? Because if it is God talking to me, <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense to me. I mean, in the morning, uh, the preacher spoke at, at prayer bend. Uh, talking about uh, the, the fishing incident where, where the instruction is given to do things that are not, are not correct from a fishing point of view. So I think, I think for Abraham, I, I, I get a sense that at this particular instance, even though the instruction did not make sense, he knew that was God talking. He had all those three days to reflect upon it because he was convinced it was God talking. And I think that's where the demonstration of faith comes, where he says, all right, you don't make sense. But because you've said it yourself, I am going to perform it. And that is why then God holds that hand to say, this test, even though it did not make sense to you, you went all the way with it because I had said something senseless in your eyes. But because I've said it, you undertook it. So I, I just think that for us, I think the most important thing is, does God talk to me? Do, do I recognize his voice? When, when I recognize his voice, that's why even David then says, though I walk through the shadow of, 
through the shadow of fear of death. I fear no evil. Because David is saying, even if God is leading me, sometimes he won't put a detour to avoid these rocky, rocky roads. But because he is leading me, I will be able to go through that. It's no longer my journey. It is his journey. So in a nutshell, I'm just saying, I'm appealing to the church that we ought to recognize when God talks to us. And when we do so, what he says does not have to make sense to us. But because he said it, we need to obey it, in a nutshell. Thank you, Alda. The hand is, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's been posed to us that we need to be able to know when God is talking to us. And it's not just necessarily when we're going through the crucibles and we're going through the trouble and the trial. It's also when things are going well. We need to be in a position where we can hear God and we know God's voice, which, to, which talks to a personal relationship with God. Because if you don't have a personal relationship with God and you haven't been talking, you won't know when he's talking to you. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, when looking at all these stories, they had a relationship with God before, and they knew his voice, and, and they trusted him fully. Sometimes we are not able to stand in the crucibles that we go through because we do not know who God is. If we know who he is, that he has everything under control, we will trust him even through, though we go through what we go through. And this crucible for me wasn't only for, for Abraham, but everybody else around Abraham. Because how can he go and to, 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 give, to make a sacrifice without the lamp? So I'm sure everyone around him, even Isaac himself, was asking himself this question. So even in Isaac's mind, he had this crucible as well, to say what's going to happen when we get to that mountain? What are we going there for? And even when his dad starts to tie him up, I'm sure he was also troubled to say what is really happening here? Am I the sacrifice? And when we look at that, now that we know the story ourselves, we know that it was in a bigger picture. God had a bigger picture even with us because that was showing the lamp of God who's going to take away all our sins. But to Abraham, he didn't know that. That was what's happening. Same with Job. He didn't even know that Satan is, he had asked him from God. But because he had a relationship and trusted God so much that he would not lose his faith because of what he was going through. So in other words, what I'm saying is, if all the crucibles we are going to go through, if we know who God is in our lives, we will not fail, we will not give up on our faith, we will hold on to our faith knowing that he has the best for us. And I love 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, they had no temptation taken you by such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So it's only those who know that God has better plans for them who will be able to go through crucibles. If you do not know that he has the best for you, you will fail and you will lose also your faith. But faith will be uh, made stronger if we know who we trust. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I agree with uh, when she says that it's all about how you relate to God. Oh God. Another angle which I have is the uniqueness of the situation, especially the situation like a job, like uh, Abraham. When Abraham got this message, married as he was, married as he had connived with the wife before, he didn't say, out in your share and your Sarah lend up. He, he didn't do that. It, it's because it was his. And then he, because he understood God's voice 
and it, he understood that it is directed at me. It is me who has got to carry this. I don't want to actually go and share this troubling thing with my wife. Let me walk this on my own because I understand where it is going to end and what it is aimed at. Another unique situation, in as much as we can think that Isaac actually was saying, Baba, where is all of these things? He didn't run away. I mean, if it was me, was, I was going to say, I began to damage where is the lamp? And then I would say, I'm not getting into the fire. But because God's intention was not about Isaac, it was about Abraham. So everything God fulfilled because the crucible was for Abraham and not for. Maybe afterwards they discussed the whole issue with Saiham by Lentella. And then we were actually not aware. We were not actually aware what is God's aim about this. But what I was just mentioning is the uniqueness of the situation as it applies to individuals. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Uh, we've got a hand here. So whilst the mic is going there, um, it was posed that Paul says, no temptation that comes to us. God doesn't allow anything that's going to overtake us, come through to us. And I was thinking about this very same verse and another verse which was mentioned in the lesson where we are told in 1 Corinthians, oh sorry, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, and then we go read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where we see Paul's hardships. And Paul wrote something interesting where he mentions how basically they were dead, and they'd lost all hope whatsoever. And in this situation where they lost all hope whatsoever and they didn't have any strength, all their hope was in God. And it got me thinking about, does God sometimes let us get through situations where we in our own power cannot endure, but if we put our hope in him, we can endure? I, I'm, I'm hoping everyone got that because when, when, when I start going down that train of thought, it's, it seems like it's conflicting with what he then also says where he says, God is not going to allow anything to come to us which we cannot overcome. Yeah, it's probably something to think about for the group. Um, okay. Um, going back to the initial question that was asked um, in, in the lesson um, about God knowing um, everything, what, what being the point of asking o Abraham to do what he had to do, considering that um, he knew very well what the result would be. Um, the lesson also points out that um, the, end is what's Im the end is not necessarily what's important, but what we learn through um, the journey that leads to the end, that reshapes us. Going back to the point that was made earlier, um, we're not really told in the Bible, but we do, we can assume that um, through, I mean, by Abraham going through with what he had to go through, he might have ministered to his wife, you know? So the things we go through and the way in which we respond to God's call sometimes is a ministry to the people around us. So um, because we know as Christians our calling is deeper than just saying what we need to say. It's how we live our life and how we practice our truth and what people see. So um, I really do believe about Job as well as Abraham, the wives being in the, in the picture but never really being pointed out by how they felt or what they went through. I do think that in seeing what the husbands did for God, they took something from it and they learned something from it through ministry. So I think it's not just about Abraham and his relationship with God, but also just the people around Abraham seeing what he has to go through in his relationship with God. But also, it also does trigger some um, remembrance or like, um, like you remember who God is in your life when you go through the things that you go through. So that could have also been a reason why he had to go through the test that he went through. So we've got two hands. 
these will probably be our last comments. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the ministering to the wives because I, I, I'd, I'd also then have a question with the other character that was mentioned and that's the prophet Hosea. He, God tells him to keep going after the wife so that she comes back. And maybe that was ministering to her and also to the people because it then also tells us that God is using that in, as an example to minister to Israel saying that as much as you keep on going out, I'm going to come get you to get you back in. Elder? I wasn't going to make this comment, but I think what the sister said uh, uh, prompted me just to make a short comment. Uh, it, it's, it's about Abraham, but little focus is given on, on Isaac. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a self-introspection, even on parents, can I instruct a grown-up child to do what Isaac did? I mean, it's, it, it talks volumes in terms of how Abraham related with his child. I mean, Isaac was probably much, much stronger. He could have over... There was no way that Isaac would, not, would have gone on that altar involuntarily. He, he went there on the weight of the father. Can you see how it cascades? He sees how the father relates to God. And when the instruction comes from the father, it's almost like it has come from God himself. And I think for parents, I'm, I'm talking about myself as well, can I be able to give such an instruction to my child and it's obeyed without question? The question has been posed to the parents. I think mine is more of a question because the issue of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac happened for our learning. Now, there are fathers who are listening here, and there are mothers who are listening here in the position of Sarah. It would be, it would be unfair for Abraham for us to leave the lesson in his life, not to apply it here. A father wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to sacrifice my son without talking to the dear wife. I think we need to somehow um, apply it to our setting. It, it, it may not be enough for us to live the lesson through the lens of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. What do we learn from this? Will it be acceptable for me to go and sacrifice Mitch? without consulting anyone. Or to say I'm going to pray with Mitch for 100 days in the mountain without talking to anyone. The elder says yes. Okay, um, the, the, the question has been posed. And it's, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rhetoric question. Okay, so we've got that will be our last comment because I was hearing the bell, and so and just before, the, just be just before that comment, um, I think it's important for us to also then talk about Thursday, and hope, before we end the lesson, because we've talked about crucibles and all these things, but we need the hope and we need to we need assistance from God to get through whatever trials we're going through. And Paul wrote that as much as they were defeated and they felt that we can't get through this, their hope was in Christ. Their hope was in God to go through it. Job says, God has given, God has taken away. Praise be to God. And in Job's situation, we see that at the end, even during it, yes, he had questions, and having questions is not a problem. The great thing is, even in his questioning, he kept on praising God, and he kept his faith in God. And even with Abraham, when it was all going through and everything happened, Abraham kept his faith in God to get through whatever situation he was going through. So may it be with us that 
we keep our hope and our faith in God as we're going through whatever life is coming at us with. Because even when we're going through the crucibles, God is still merciful. Imagine God could have allowed for Job's wife to die. Maybe that was the one thing that was going to defeat him. We don't know. Or in Abraham's case, God may, may have let him go through with it and not stop him on the way. With Paul, all his ordeals and everything, even the prayer where he was praying for, the thorn that was in his flesh, God could have just let him get through things he couldn't endure and just die without hope or just be an example of how bad or how crazy God can be. But we see that in all these things, at the end of the day, God was with his people and God kept his people. Uh, thank you, Bradley. Um, sorry for extending your time. Yeah, but it's an extra hard <laughs> topic. You know, so there's a lot to say. Um, in relation to the question that was asked by Richard, yeah, I think in law they say that uh, you cannot both uh, reprobate and approbate. Um, if your wife does not say to you, my Lord, just like what Sarah did, um, then you cannot do what Abraham did. So it was when Abraham would talk to Sarah, Sarah would say, my Lord, <laughs> to, to Abraham. It just shows what a man he was. Sometimes we want to be treated uh, in a different way when we don't deserve it. So I think as men, it's a challenge also that we must have the same character, the same integrity that the patriarch of Mamre had. Uh, so I think in that uh, case, Sarah had full trust in Abraham and it went the way it went. I just want to conclude, uh, maybe, uh, to conclude my uh, presentation uh, with uh, uh, what is pointed out uh, uh, under Thursday. It says, uh, God's extreme heat is to destroy not us, but our sin. Second, God's extreme heat is not to make us miserable, but to make us pure, as we were created to be. Third, God's care for us through all things is constant and tender. He will never leave us alone, no matter what happens to us. Thank you for the comment. Um, may you please just close for us in prayer then, as we end our lesson. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we will thank you for this lesson. We have a lot to learn, Father. We have many things that we continue to miss as Christians, as your followers, as your children. But as this lesson was coming to us, we have moments of searching to see whether we have a relationship with you that will enable us to withstand extreme heat. Because there is extreme heat ahead in our lives, and it will it's be very, very disappointing, disappointing if we, if we fail, fail to overcome, to overcome that, situation. that situation. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, give us the faith that we will, we will we withstand, withstand such great trial, trial, and give, and us, give us the them. hope that transcends all these details in our lives that lie ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, may we have a blessed Sabbath. Maybe start by the church.
One, two. One, two, one, two. Hello, I want to. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Let us pray for our song service. Let us pray. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our kind heavenly Father, we thank you, we worship you. Thank you for the lessons and thank you for the Holy Sabbath where we come together to celebrate creation, to commemorate our redemption, oh dear God, in Jesus Christ. Father God, may you guide us, may you be with us as we sing praises in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Hymn 23. Let's go to hymn 23.
Number one three one. Oh, 
like to greet the church in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. What do we say? Amen. Oh, this is, this is, this is awful. Lift up Christ. Yeah. You need to do signs. <laughs> COVID has really killed us. Lift up Christ. Yeah. Lift up Christ. Yeah. Uh, can we all stand up? <laughs> let's, let's, let's just try to be, it's like we are not really in the spirit. Lift up Christ. Tell the world, God is good all the time. Let's say it like we believe it. God is good all the time. We may be seated. Uh, may, uh, may I take the opportunity to welcome all of you into our divine service. And we thank the Lord that, uh, we, we thank the Lord that uh, after probably a hectic week, uh, we are all here today. For the purposes of praising, exalting, and lifting his name. In our midst, I know that there are visitors. Just raise your hand if you are coming to Golden Harvest for the first time today. Uh, just raise your hand. I won't do much more than that. Can you see all these hands? Just raise your hands. Please feel welcome. Uh, this is the church. You must bring your name here. It's a very, very warm and hospitable church. Don't listen to what others may say. Listen to what I, I tell you myself. Uh, just to welcome us to the service, I want us just to reflect on this text. Uh, I was going through it this morning and I found it quite, uh, quite encouraging. It comes from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Now listen to what it says. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. I mean, this is quite, quite a powerful text. And uh, it spoke to me. And I thought that uh, I would share it uh, during this time as we welcome each other uh, into this service. Now, you saw that there's a long entourage. Uh, all these people have got very important announcements that they are going to give us. But I'll ask the communications team at this time uh, to, to fly to the announcements. Uh, communications, let's fly the announcements. And after that, uh, we'll have the church clerk, uh, and I'll decide who comes after the church clerk, depending on, on how long it takes. Announcements? Let's go ahead. Christ to me, 
Sabbath Church. A warm welcome to everyone today, especially our visitors. I'm going to be reading church transfer names, so I encourage visitors to transfer their names to Golden Harvest. The list is a bit long, so bear with me. Um, for transfers in, I've got Pelina Sibanda, from your view, SDA Church. Belfa Nyangura from Highfield, Maine, SDA Church in Harare. Nadia Nlea from Westenbeck, SDA Church in Pulukwane. Clement Piri from Cosmos City, SDA Church in Cosmos City. Johannes Alexander Chipunza from Harare Boulder, SDA Church in Harare. Nometa Mutiro from Zinuza SDA Church in Nyazura, Zimbabwe. Kelvin Soko from Wora SDA Church in Mzimba, Malawi. Aida Ndawandawa from Wora SDA Church in Mzimba, Malawi. Benjamin Makusha from Great Zimbabwe SDA Church in Zimbabwe. Selindi Lebebe from Johannesburg Central SDA Church. Brilliant Zibusi Sosbanda from Jobek Central SDA Church. Divine Ndlovu from Jobek Central SDA Church. And for transfers out, I've got Sipo Masinga to Summer Pride SDA Church in East London, Eastern Cape. Tembiso Stutuzile Ndlovu to Mpisini SDA Church, Esikodini, Zimbabwe. Um, Shailet Muchkasira from Amaveni West SDA Church in Kwekwe, Zimbabwe. Philemon Mwandira, um, sorry, to Kawua SDA Church in Mzuzu, Malawi. So this is the first reading. I'll go through the names quickly again. Um, Pelina Svanda from your view, SDA Church, Belfa Nyangura, from Highfield, Maine, SDA, Nadia Nlea, from Western Bank, SDA, Bulukwane, Clement Piri, from Cosmo City, Johannes Alexander Chipunza, from Harare Boulder, SDA Church, Nometa Mutiro, from Zinuza, SDA Church in Nyazura, Kelvin Soko from Hora SDA Church in Mzimba, Malawi. Aida Ndawandawa from Hora SDA Church in, Mz in Mzimba, Malawi. Benjamin Makusha from Great Zimbabwe SDA Church. Silindi Lepepe from Jobek Central SDA Church. Brilliant Zibusiso Sivanda from Jobek Central SDA Church. Divine Lovu from Jobek Central SDA Church. And for transfers out, it's Vusis Sipo Masinga, pardon me, Sipo Masinga to Summer Pride SDA in East London, Eastern Cape, Tembiso Stutuzile Ndlovu to Mpisini SDA in Esikodini, Zimbabwe, Shailet Mchikasira to Amaveni West SDA Church in Kwekwe, Zimbabwe. Filmoni Mwandira to Kawa SDA Church in Mzuzu, Malawi. 
So these are all the names we have for today. This is first reading. We're going to be doing second reading and voting next week. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, Church. Uh, we just want to start off with a verse from 1 Corinthians 16, verses 14, which says, Let all that you do be done in love. And in the spirit of love and in the spirit of giving, the Ambassador Club has started a charity foundation called the Helping Hands Foundation. And we will be basically having our first food drive on the 13th of August, uh, 2022. And we would just ask the church to help us and support us as well as we are just trying to give back to the community. Um, if you have any questions or want to find out anything, you can just contact myself, Fadzai, or Kim, as well as Raymond Chikavanga. Okay, so. I'll, be, I'll be reading out the list of things we encourage you to donate that will be given on the 13th of August. So we have canned foods such as beans, peas, fish, or bread, but um, we encourage you to give money donations so that we can donate fresh bread, jam or margarine, face cloth, a bar of soap, toilet paper, bottles of water, and we'll also be accepting cash donations. You can send them through to the church account. Um, just the last thing as well, um, the ambassadors will be going uh, for an ambassador talk at the park. So just to all the ambassadors today, after divine service, may we please just meet on the lawn. Amen. I greet the church in the name of Jesus. Amen. We want to thank God for this opportunity that he has given us um, for us to talk about our finances as a church. Okay, so I'm going to just run through the presentation because of time and um, start with the first, first Corinthians 4 verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found to be what? To be found to be faithful. Okay, so we are, as stewards, it is a requirement that we be found to be faithful. And I'll start with an announcement that our... Um, Electronic envelope link is down, so let's make sure that we use the paper envelopes or contact the or contact the treasurer, contact the treasurer. So because our electronic envelope is down, now um, this graph it's deliberate that there is no heading; it's just the amounts and the months. And uh, what do we see from this graph? What is the trend for this graph? It's what? It's going up. Okay. Now, the next one, this graph. And, and uh, these are graphs about, about golden harvest. And, and this is what? This is going down. So, um, so, so guess, which is which here? Can we guess? Which one is going up? Which one is going down? Sorry? Tithe is going up. Okay. Tithe. Uh, uh, what is going up? Expenses are going up. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So now, this is this is the current situation now. Um, so the blue, it is our local church income. 
the blue. It is our what? Yes, this blue is what we are bringing into the church which is remaining here for all the activities, for the lights to be on, for the water, everything. It is what? What is happening? It is going down. And this is the current situation. But now these costs now, the red ones, which are going on their way up. These are the recurrent expenses. So I've not, we have not even factored um, the cost of uh, programming. These are fixed costs. That for us to have water, to have electricity, to have Wi-Fi, to be able to beam what we are beaming right now, um, the costs are going up. For, for this place to be clean, the fixed costs are going up. So our recurrent expenses are increasing, yet our local church budget contributions are decreasing. And it's good that I'm speaking to the church today because we can do something about it as members. We can do something about it as individuals. So what is the message? The message is to give, give, give. So it's not so much that our expenses are going up, but it is, be it is primarily because our giving is going down. So the encouragement is for us to give to the local church budget. So... Uh, so what tends to happen right now, um, the young ladies have uh, promoted their project. What, what are we going to do as, as a church? We take from the local church budget and we give towards a project. So the encouragement today is that we are giving sacrificially. We are giving more. more than we are. So we are contributing towards all the other wonderful programs, but we are also consistently faithfully, generously, and systematically giving towards the local church budget. So here I'm talking to every one of us. I'm talking to the young people. The young people will say, ah, oh, no, the adults will do it. But this is coming to everyone. This is coming to everyone. So right now, the current situation that we have, what we, do, what we have is currently the income is less than our outflows. And at the, end of the, at the end of the year, if we remain like this, what is going to happen? We won't be able to meet our commitments. We won't be able to co make our commitments. So the good thing is that God has blessed us. So bring what you have. Bring what you have. And give to the local church. Give systematically. So use an envelope. Use an envelope and write local church budget. Use an envelope. So today, when the deacons are going around with envelopes, please pick an envelope. Whether, it's, whether you're young, whether you're old, pick an envelope and give generously. Give faithfully and give consistently. Give systematically. So systematically, when we're saying systematically, don't just put in the basket, but use an envelope so that you write local church budget or you write where you want money to go. And I'm also encouraging the church. Today, we're going to have a church business meeting. Please be involved. Please come so that we can discuss these issues. Right now, I'm just making an announcement, but I'm sure you've got lots of questions. So in the church business meeting, we can then field those questions. So the concluding text, as stewards, we are required that we be found to be what? To be found faithful. And may we be those stewards who are faithful. Amen. Um, for our call to worship. So, so in short, the church has no money. We need money. The church needs money. So that's the that's, that's summary of this presentation. Please offer towards the local fund. For our call to worship, just a reminder, you might have noticed on the, on the presentation that today is a strategic forecast day. So what does it mean? It means it's a day that we will put focus on where we want to see the church going in the next three, five, or even ten years. And uh, for our call to worship, we obviously have to read a verse that talks to this. So we're going to use uh, Proverbs chapter 29, and I'll read verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
this text is just saying to us, as somebody once said, if you don't have a vision in life, anywhere else becomes a destination. And we are saying as a church, we do have a five-year plan that is being revised now. And I'm encouraging you individually, even as families, as an individual, have somewhere that you want to see yourself in the next, in the short, medium, or long term. Don't just live your life just living it like anyhow. You have your life planned and pray about those plans so that God may be able to have them fulfilled. We are going to, to pray, but I just want to, to, to check uh, as we go into this season of prayer. There could be somebody who just came here for a prayer. Uh, they have a specific issue that they are praying for. And it will be a tragedy if we don't afford them that opportunity to receive that prayer. So before we pray, if there is somebody, I'm not asking for a general prayer request, somebody who says, I came, I've got an issue that I need to be prayed for, to be presented before the Lord. You can raise your hand. Is it just do one hymn, one hymn of uh, sweet of prayer? Just, just the verse, first verse. And if that is your desire, you can just raise your hand as we pray together. Sweet of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. That calls me from on my way of care and be me at my father strong me Shall 
troda e Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we would like to thank you for affording us today this opportunity to come before you, a holy God, a mighty God. Thank you for giving us the Sabbath, that in it we may receive you and receive the blessings. Here are your people who left their places of residence and came to the temple so that they may render unto you their petitions. They have these deep down in their hearts that they are bringing to you now, right here in your presence. We pray, Lord, that you may attend to them. Listen to them now and answer their prayers now. And we pray that if there is any sin that needs to be confessed so that these prayers may be answered, talk to your people here they are, that they may confess so that you may answer our prayers. We pray that when you have done so, we may not depart from your presence. We remain and every day cherish your presence in our lives. Thank you, God, for answering these because they came so that you may answer that when they leave the gates of this temple, they, their burdens have been lifted. Probably they didn't even come for this song. They did not come for this sermon. They just came so that you may answer their prayers. Answer our prayers as your church. Deliver us from sin and come soon and take us home. Write our names. May they not be deleted until you come. For we have prayed in the one and the only name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is coming soon. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are reminded of Elijah at Mount Carmel. When the Baal prophets, were Baal, prophets to Baal had prayed all day, the Bible records that at the time of the evening sacrifice, your servant commenced his prayer. And he reminded everybody that he was praying to a God who neither sleeps nor slumbers. Amen. And we want to thank God that the evidence of your answering prayer was seen. For fire rained from heaven and burnt that offering. Even the waters that were put, that Elijah did that were poured on the offering. Here are your people. We thank you because you know each and every person who is here by name. Amen. Not only by name, but you know that which has brought them here. Amen. It could be an issue in their marriage, it could be children, it could be illness, it could be bereavement, it could be relationships, it could be financial, it could be work issues, it could be relating to others, whatever it is. Amen. Oh, we worship a God who knows it. So our prayer today is simple. May you intervene in a way you know best. May nobody who has come up for this prayer go back the way they came before. May that healing power, if it's required, be exercised now. May that intervention, may a door that should be opened, be opened indeed. So that when, at the end of it all, we'll be able to have a testimony that says we worship a God who answers prayer. Amen. And we worship a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. I'm asking, dear Lord, that may you write a miracle in each and every person's life today. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 M202 
M202. Kosi Jesu ngikube pakati kwa malingo atuma mayoki ndawo wena twa langi fife iskondi so esako sing it in English. 67. Be the joys of road. We are marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We are marching up us to Zion. The beautiful 
city of God. 285, as the officers are marching in, will make use of him. 285 will rise as the officers march in. There is a place of quiet and rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin can Time has come that you speak unto us. Suspend our knowledge, suspend our intelligence, but let the Spirit speak to us. In our own way, Father, help us hear your word. Let us grow from here, and let us hear your vision that you have for us as, a, as individuals and as a church. Bless us, Father, we pray. Amen. Uh, we'll make use of him Two two four, M two two four. Our first song, let the lower lights be burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy. Brightly beams to, brightly beams our Father's mercy. From this land, runs evermore. Bright to up, seek is the keeping of the light. Surely the Lord, one lies be burning, send a glim across the way. Some of them, things struggling, say man, you may rescue, you may save. Dark the night, throw sin and set Fall in my 
We're going to, to read Luke chapter 5, verse 5. I'm reading in your hearing in the King James Version. It says, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I invite the church for a prayer as we kneel down. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thou, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of life. We thank you for the opportunity to come in your house and pray. At this moment, as we are going to begin the service, we wish to invite the Holy Spirit to be amongst us. May you kindly talk to the hearts that are in this place. May you bless us in a special way. May you say your word once and may it be heard many times in our hearts. May you please um, heal someone who could, who could be here and cannot hear the word because of any ailment that could be hindering them. May you please be with the speaker so that all that you will speak will be coming from you. Bless us as many way, in many ways as you see fit. We thank you so much because you are God. And we thank you so much for the gift of the prayer and for the gift of worship and for the gift of um, your word. Because in your word, we are blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has done a wonderful thing for us to be here this morning, the Sabbath. And today, we've got the strategic committee that's going to be take us through things. But before I even get into that, do we have any visitors with us today? If we have any visitors, may you please kindly stand just for a moment. Visitors. Amen. What does the church say? Amen. For our visitors, thank you for joining us today. God is good and he's going to do a wonderful work in your life. The good thing is next time, may you please come back. You won't be visitors. You will be part of us. So what's going to happen is please don't leave. We've got lunch that's going to be served here and so that we may fellowship with you. Thank you for coming. May God bless you. So our order of service this morning, we just had our first prayer, and now I'm introducing the service. What's going to happen straight after I'm done, we're going to have the offertory. Then after the offertory, we're going to have the children's story. After the children's story, we're going to have a second song, which is going to be hymn number 202. Straight after the second song, we're going to have our preacher standing up. Before our preacher stands up and all, 
Our first prayer was from Sister Mandisa. Our offertory is going to come from Sister Matanire. And my name is Bradley. And our preacher this day today is Dr. Masuku. May we all be blessed. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. May the deacons wait upon us. Today for our offertory, we are going to consider a text that comes from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. I'm going to read in your hearing, and it's going to come from the New Living Translation. It reads, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer, and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. In this text, Paul was urging the Corinthians to be generous in their giving, to suffering Christians who were in Jerusalem. He encouraged the Corinthians to willingly and cheerfully give a portion of what God had given to them. As we give today, let us do so out of love, not out of obligation or command. God is ultimately the one who gives. He is the one who provides both the seed for the bread and the bread itself. In other words, God makes the giver capable of giving. Paul concludes the verse by saying that God will multiply the seed of those who give in order to increase the harvest of the righteousness. Let us give a portion of what God has blessed us with, be it time, talent, or money. That will go a long way in harvesting souls for Christ. May we pray? Gracious Father, who art above, we thank you, dear Lord, for all the provisions that you have given unto us. I pray, Almighty Lord, that you may help us to give not out of obligation or command, but give faithfully and give us systematically. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I even pray that we may impart this to our children, that when they can learn to give young as they are, even when they grow up, they are not going to depart from such. For this is our humble prayer in the mighty name of Christ, I pray, amen. We'll make use of him 15 as we collect our offering 15 and we transit into the children's sermon in 15. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him below, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates will open wide. He will wash away my sins, let his children child come. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, loves me still, when I'm sad or weak and ill, from his shining throne on high, come. 
comes to watch me where I lie. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him by and by, he will take me home on high. Now you can come. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. All the children come forward. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the Jesus Christ, amen. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Thank you. How are you today? I am doing good. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask one child to pray for us. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the day you've given us. May you please bless us and may you please help us to listen to the story. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you. Um, the verse for today is Deuteronomy 13, verse 4. Uh, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Amen. Kids, I'm presenting you these things to you right now. Can someone tell me what is this? And what is used for? It's used for picking up Good. And this one? I'm sure your mommy used this at home. What is this? What is this? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's for frying, to picking up things, to prevent things from bending. Okay? And this one, what is this one? And what is it used for? It's for use for eating for adults, eh? And you, who used to use this one at home? I do. I do. 
Yes, you. Yes, it's for kids. Okay. Yeah. And this one is used to. <laughs> yes, it's used to make pasta. Thank you. It's used to save pasta. And this one is used to save soup. And this one is used to, to pick for hot stuff from the pan, from the pot, from the oven. And this one is used to, 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 to fry eggs, to eat. <laughs> yeah, it, you, this one works for many things. It saves for many things. Yeah. Amen. All the five utensils are used to save food in their own ways. Just as you and me, children, uh, pathfinders, adventurers, uh, youth, and old people, we are to save God in different ways. Uh, we can save God in our own way. Pray, asking God that he may use you in the way that pleases him. Do not compare yourself with others. Just be you. And you alone, you can conquer all of it. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, what above, we want to thank you this morning. We come before your throne of grace. Father, we ask that you can use us in any way that pleases you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can all the five uh, to nine go to the chapel? Thank you. M202, may the church rise. M202.
Good morning, church. May I welcome all our visitors and uh, regular members and all those that are watching online to today's Sabbath. We are here. Maybe not by through all protocol of the earth. It's not acceptable. <laughs> all right. Today is a beautiful day because we're talking strategy, isn't it? And uh, I think most of us are wondering what has the church got to do with strategy? Does the church need a strategy? Or is it only for corporates? You know, sometimes we sit and ask ourselves, is it relevant to have a strategy? Did Jesus have a strategy? So, if that's the case, then I think the elders have done well to dedicate a day when we learn about strategy and we look at strategy. The strength of any strategy lies in its simplicity. The strength of any strategy lies in its simplicity. If it's complicated, it's useless because you can't understand it. As, I, as we prepared for this day, we, we try to look to say, what has made, for those that are in corporate, you would like this, right? What has made companies successful? A study was done in 2017 to look at the uh, top 100 successful companies. These are billionaire, billion US dollar companies. And it was discovered that of the, twin, of the top 30 companies, only one had a vision. Only one had a vision. Isn't that surprising? So you all think that your company is a vision, right? But does it? So for those companies, only one had a vision. But all of them had a mission. All of those come with a mission. But only one had a vision. So it's quite interesting that some of these things that we go through in life, um, we, we, we observe them. And we ask, does our church have a vision? Does our church have a mission? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, the hour has come that you get magnified and I get lowered. Let your spirit speak and bring understanding unto us. Explain what you want us to hear in your own way. In the Father we pray, amen. So our text of consideration comes from the book of um, Luke. Uh, can I ask you to read for me from the mic? So we're going to look, uh, to look uh, for, at, at the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Thank you. The title here is saying that um, the call of the first disciples, verse 1, and it came to pass that as the people were pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down thy nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done, they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their neck brake, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, that, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that way with him, at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, 
which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto him, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you to that reading. Let's just get a background to this passage. We will use this passage to try and understand the strategy, how strategy works and how you can apply to the church today. The background to this text is like this. At this time when um, Luke writes, he is reminded of what had happened. The disciples had not been chosen, all right? They were just followers of Jesus. They were just followers of Jesus. And they had witnessed the arrest of John. They had witnessed the incarceration of John. And they were despondent. But at the same time, particularly for Peter, he had witnessed Jesus healing his mother-in-law. So from the text, you can tell that Peter was married, right? So he had, Peter had witnessed um, his mother-in-law being healed. So in that background, Peter and other disciples, because they are feeling low, they are feeling despondent, they say, you know what, let's go back to our old work, right? We all do that, isn't it? When things don't work, we go out to what we know best. I mean, if we follow Jesus, what hope is there for us? John at that time was mightier than Jesus because of his works. Now he's arrested. So they are, they're not feeling well. So they go to their works and that's where Luke writes and says, now by the sea Jesus finds uh, these guys. So in that particular aspect, I want us to carefully study that, 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 that passage and learn how Jesus applied strategy. You know, Jesus was not haphazard. He planned this thing. So we want to see what it is that Jesus went about to do so that we can apply it to ourselves today. The first thing that we, we, we learn is that you need to create the right conditions for strategy to succeed. Right? You need to create what? The right conditions for strategy to succeed. That's the first lesson we pick up. How do you pick up this lesson? So, follow with me carefully there. In verse, in, in verse 1 he says, so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats. You see, Jesus, there's a crowd and he's with them. Does he need to go into a boat? Does he need to get away from the people? No, he doesn't. As you can see later in the Gospels, he was among the crowds, he was comfortable. But at this point, he specifically goes into a boat. There was an object lesson there. During the night, Peter he had not caught a single fish. Jesus comes. Peter had said, Jesus, if I'm following you, I'm going to end up disappointing like I've done with John. So let me go back to what I know. But when he goes back to what he knows, he catches nothing. He catches nothing. Jesus arrives. And there is a multitude right opposite the sea. Jesus dried the ocean that there should be no fish. Peter was being prepared by Jesus to understand that the fish that you did not catch are outside. Peter could not understand this, but Jesus was creating conditions that could make Peter one man. Remember, this passage is about one man. Not many disciples, but one man. The fish that you did not catch are outside. He sits in the boat and he begins to preach. You know, when we talk about strategy, it is important that circumstances that prevail to support it are purposefully created so that people can appreciate the strategy. Had Peter gone and caught the fish, would he have gone back to Jesus? Probably not. But God for you, and God created the conditions that on that which you depend on, on yourself to succeed, I'm going to try it for you. I'm going to teach you a new lesson based on what you know best. The fish is not in the water. The fish is outside. So when we talk about strategy, whether it's personal or it's about the church, we need to take time to create the right conditions for it to succeed. This was the object lesson. So the people there, they came. 
They came just for Peter to be taught a simple lesson. Second lesson that we pick from, the, from, 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 from this uh, passage. Strategy requires resources for it to succeed. My elder was standing here. He summed it nicely. I, I, I like elders. You know, they, they become unapologetic. The church is bankrupt. It needs money. Right? We're sounding like Pentecostal. The church needs money. Strategy to succeed needs resources. There could be money for those in corporate, what you call it, capex. Right? It needs money, capex, um, time, effort. But in the church, it needs you physically. Church strategy needs you physically. That's the first requirement we need as a, as, 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 as a church. For this strategy to succeed, it needs resources. And the biggest resource is your physical being. Why? Because Christ wants to save a soul. And that is you. There can never be a church strategy without you. There can never be a church strategy without you participating. This passage, Jesus came to this lake for one man. Not, not the multitude. They were by and by for one man. And when you talk about strategy, it needs a resource and you are the resource. Let's, let's look at carefully there. So, Peter is instructed by Jesus after he finished talking. He says, thrust your net. Can you imagine? Let me, let me paint this nicely to you. Jesus is a carpenter by profession, right? He's born of a carpenter. What does he know? Carpentry. Saws, nails, paint, glue. And hammer knows nothing about water. Knows nothing about how water behaves. Knows nothing about fishing. Right? Let's take it literally. Right? He then says to this man who's an experienced fisherman, well bred, well trained fisherman, <laughs> thrust the net. Peter looks at Jesus. <laughs> look, at, look at verse 5. Carefully look at verse 5. Let's study verse 5. But Peter answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught. Was Peter wrong? You know why he said that? He was looking at Jesus and said, You don't know what you're talking about. You know nothing about fishing. Let me tell you, we have toiled all night. Because you and I know that you only fish at night. But you have want me to fish during the day. Carpenter, telling me. How many times when somebody comes with a strategy and we say, I know better than you. Hmm? You're busy promoting a ministry here. No, I know better than you. You should have done that and that. Are you wrong? No, you're not wrong because you know. But does it work? No, it doesn't work. So Peter questioned Jesus based on visual and practical experience. And that is why strategy fails. Because we always base it on the now. And we don't look into the future. Yet strategy is about the future. But in his confusion and questioning of Jesus, he remembers that this man he had healed my mother-in-law. That, he then continues. What does he say when he continues in that verse? Nevertheless. Nevertheless, Nevertheless says, Nga nani? Nga se nani? Because it's you. <laughs> if it wasn't you, I wouldn't do it. That's what it says. He has given up. He says, because it's you, Lord. Because I remember what you have done. I will thrust the net. Strategy needs resources. But the resources should be evidence enough to propel or to move people forward. Without resources, there can never be a strategy. It's just a wish list. Peter throws the net into the deep. He catches a lot of fish, right? Yet he had not caught the fish during the night. Does it make sense? It doesn't. That's str sometimes stretch does not make sense when people hear it first time around. Sometimes it's confusing. 
people say it's fluffy, fluffy stuff, isn't it? But the strategy, if you follow through it and follow it properly, you will see the results. Yet Peter not listened to God. Yet Peter not said, nevertheless, we would not be reading this text today. But we think that Peter understood that there are things that you must accept by faith. There are things that you must move you by faith. He catches the fish more than it ever caught before. May I propose to you that the same amount of people that were sitting outside was the same number of fish that he caught that day. Because it was an object lesson that the master was teaching him. You may be good at what you do, but in God's hands, you can be perfect. You may be good in what you do, but in God's hands, you'll be perfect. Peter was a good fisherman. He knew how to fish, but he had never caught as much fish until that day because he was in God's hands. If we work in God's hand, we execute his mandate, we become perfect. That's the lesson that we learn. The third objective lesson we learn from here is that for strategy to succeed, it needs core workers. It needs what? Core workers. You cannot deliver strategy alone. Never. No matter how good you are, no matter how perfect you are, you cannot deliver strategy what? alone. You need others. So, the boats are full of fish. What does Peter do? He calls others. He calls others. You know, there's a tendency amongst us that when the going is good, I shut everybody out. When the going is bad, I call everybody. Now, I wish you could have a prayer where people come and say, I don't have a problem. I want to thank God. See how many people will come. When you say people have got problems, come. It's full. It's full. You know why? Because we are empty. We need help. When we are full, we want nobody. It's mine and mine alone. Some of us to the point that we deprive our children of the benefits that we have acquired. We learn that strategy needs selfless, selfless people, not selfish people. Peter understood simple things. That the boat would sink if he did not ask for help. The boat was full of fish, right? Without help, what would happen? It was going to sink together with him and his fish. <laughs> he understood that lesson. Secondly, Peter understood that I must not lose a single fish that I've caught. Very clear. He understood that I must not lose even a single fish that I've caught. Because it's not my fish. I've been told to lower the nets. He who sent me wants me to bring every single fish. When we go to minister, every single fish we catch, we are accountable for it. If you promise to pray for somebody out there, if you don't, you are guilty. Rather not promise. Peter understood that lesson. You must not lose a single fish that which you have caught. He also understood that for success in this mission, I must get others. He calls others. And above all, what does he learn? That success in strategy is a teamwork. We, we have got all different strengths. We have got all different capabilities. Jesus did not call James. Did he? Jesus did not call Peter. He did not call the others. But he called Peter on that day, isn't it? and gave Peter the instruction. But Peter called others. When we work for God, let us have the capacity. When the field is ripe, let's have the capacity to call others. For glory is unto the Lord and not unto us. Strategy to succeed as we launch it, as we work onto it, for it to succeed, we need every single hand to work. And when we work, we don't compete. I grew up in rural areas where we used to plow. Somebody would be holding the plow. Somebody would be following behind with what? With the seed. Who is more important? The one holding the plow or the one putting the seed on the ground? 
All are equal. They are playing different roles. We need to learn that in God's work. That we play different tunes, but in harmony. And that Peter understood very well. The other lesson that we pick up from this text is that for strategy to succeed, we need leaders that know right from wrong. So many times strategy fails because of lack of leadership. Jesus, in this text, I'll illustrate to you leadership. He begins to look at leaders whom he can send. So he targets Peter. Remember his created conditions for Peter? He has showed Peter that that which you thought you could not get by running away from me because you fear John is there, is going to be in jail, is in jail. I can give it more than you can get. And remember, just one step, remember again, when, when Jesus had given Peter, Ellen White then says, God was repaying for the use of Peter's boat. God does not ask of you that which he hasn't given you. You are so stingy with tithes and offerings, yet God gave you first. And they will dry. Then we come running, elders pray for me, I've lost my job. Elders pray for me, my business is in trouble. Yet when it was not in trouble, he never gave tithe or offerings. That's the problem. God will never ask of you or from you that which is not provided for. And our God doesn't use things for free. That's why he gave Peter the fish to pay for the use of the pot. <laughs> that is our God. Strategy. When we go to work in the fields, let us not use anybody's things. Let's use our own. So that there are no fingers pointed at us. That's where the success lies. So when Peter sees all this fish, he's shocked, he's amazed, and he says, depart from me. For I am what? Sinful. Leaders are required to know what is sin. Don't compromise. Don't uh, chew on sin. Don't make sin palatable. Just call it a sin and leave it alone. You know, sin knows no color. Sin knows no status. Sin is a sin. You can vote <laughs> to make a sin right. It doesn't change to be a sin. Right? You know, I like Adventists. We like voting. We debate and we vote, isn't it? Let's vote. All in favor? Yes, yes. That does not make it right. It's still a sin. When Peter saw the fish that had been caught, he understood that this is not normal. Instinctively, remember I said this was a personal matter. Peter instinctively, through the power of the Holy Spirit, saw his personality, saw his life, and compared it to God, and saw how sinful he was. Nature could not behold the glory of God. And involuntarily he echoed, depart from me if I'm sinful. It was not by choice. <laughs> you know, when you're in the presence of holiness, you utter words that you don't want to utter. Ask Baal. He will bless when he's supposed to curse. <laughs> Ask Isaiah. Oh, unto me, I'm undone. If you're in the presence of God, things happen. God is looking for leaders who will stand for truth Amen. even if heavens fall. Even if others leave you alone and outcast you, God is looking for leaders. Amen. And Peter understood right from wrong. He could have made stories about himself. Peter, look at this interesting thing. Peter did not focus on the fish at that moment. He said, depart from me. You and I can't be together. <laughs> Your works and my works can't be together. Jesus was proving and showing to Peter that I've got a bigger plan for you. 
Our vision, our mission should be strong enough to convince anybody out there. Not by words, but by actions. Jesus proved to Peter that that which you are running away from to come and catch it the night, I can supply more than enough. When we go and say we are praying for people there, we must pray indeed. And there must be results. When we say we've got a warm church, when they come, they must find a warm church. There must be no stories. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Interestingly, have you ever asked yourself how old was Peter when he was called? How old were the disciples? They were young. How young? An interesting thing we learn from me is that Jesus chose teenagers to be leaders. So Christ comes by the lake. He's got followers, right? He then looks around and someone starts calling people. And the first one he calls is Peter. Now, let's go into Jewish tradition a little bit here to understand, to put it in context. So, by 12, if you're a Jewish boy, you should be knowing the Torah, right? You should know it inside out. You graduate, right? By 15, you should be attached. So, if you have mastered the Torah, you have graduated, you're a bright student, by, by 12, by 15, you get attached to a rabbi or a teacher who will then teach you from 15 to about 20 years old, right? But if you're not too bright, you wouldn't be attached. You'd go and work. And where do we find Peter? Working. So was he bright? According to Jewish tradition. So, you, so we can conclude that he wasn't too bright. And we can look at the verses. Acts 4 verse 13. It reads, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, they were unschooled in the ways of the world. They were unschooled in the normal education, but not in Christ. That's why they were shocked. So, so, so we can conclude that Peter, when Jesus found him, he was a boy, but he was working. Which means he didn't, he didn't have a rabbi. He was not attached to somebody to teach him. Right? Right. We also know that when you, when, you, when you get attached to rabbi at 15, you go for about five years. At 20, you become, if you have succeeded in your training with the rabbi, you become a disciple of that rabbi. From 20 to about 25, 26, 27 years, you become a disciple. Right? That, that was the, the way they would follow. Where do we find Peter? Fishing. Does he have a rabbi? No. So that means Peter did not follow all those? Steps. But we know that Peter was married. Right? <laughs> we know that Peter was married. But we know that Peter was not working. So how old was Peter? Right. In that context, then we, we, we quickly look at Jesus when, 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 he, when he comes, when, when he comes in, into the temple. He's asked, the, the, the Pharisees then say to him, why are you not paying the temple tax? Hmm? So they come to Peter, Peter, why is your master not paying the temple tax? Then Jesus says to Peter, go to the ocean, and what? The first fish you catch, what do you do? Open its mouth, take the money, pay tax for you, for who? You and me. And you could only pay tax if you were 20. But there were more disciples because Jesus had arrived with other disciples, isn't it, at that time? But only Peter and Jesus are paying what? Tax. And tax in Jewish customs is paid when you are 20. So Peter was between the age of 20 and 25. So he's quite young. So you ask yourself, why don't we have elders that are between 20 and 25? Is it, is it was that too young? Are they not schooled in the ways of the church? 
You know, the interesting thing about this, why I'm making it deliberate, is that we are so quick as Adventists to say, God calls the unqualified and he qualifies them. Right? God calls the unqualified. And, but I've never seen the very simple, same people saying, let's call the young man at 20 to become an elder. God will qualify him. Suddenly, the statement doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. But for an elder, for an adult man who's married, who has never been an elder, yes, he can. You know why? Because God will qualify him. But for a young man who's 25, no, God can't qualify him. That's a hypocrisy. Strategy needs people that are true and honest. What is good for John is good for Mary. It can't be good for John only, not Mary. Jesus here calls Peter, paying text at the age of 20, to become a disciple, to change the world. He, Ellen White then writes and says, Jesus did purposefully not choose the elders of the church or the learned because they were schooled the wrong way. In fact, there were vessels that did not have the capacity to comprehend what Jesus wanted to say about. They were not worthy to transfer the knowledge from heaven to the people. That's why he overlooked them. The elders, the, the teachers of law, he just overlooked them. Those that stood in the way, he overlooked them. You know why? They were polluted. And they were set in their old ways of doing the strategy of salvation. Remember, they'd been preaching the gospel their own way for years, isn't it? It had no vision or mission aligned with heaven. So Christ had to choose differently. It reminds me of Jesse. The prophet Samuel comes to anoint a king. What does he do? Calls his sons, not daughters. Calls the sons. But he leaves a young boy. What do boys know? They're unschooled. What do boys know? Boys don't sit at Dale. I don't know what you say it in English. Boys don't sit among men when men talk strategy, isn't it? Do boys sit? No, they are called to bring water. Bring water. Bring. Because they are looked as unimportant, uneducated, unqualified, their children. And God said, that is the one that I want. But what are we saying in our strategy? Yeah, he's educated that one. He can speak well. Did you see his suit? Yeah, he dresses well. He can, he can represent us. That thing is, if he can't dress well, how can he represent us among the other churches? We say that, isn't it? Did you hear how he, read, how he reads his English? It's not good enough. We find want men that can read the Bible. But God does not look at outward things. God came and chose a 25-year-old young boy to become the pillar of his mission. Strategy requires young people with energy, with strength. The question is, is the church ready? Is the church ready? Is the church ready? Not the, are you ready? You'll be chosen to go to the nominating committee. Are you going to choose a young man? Stop blaming other people. Are you? The challenge to the strategy again. Vessels must also. In the morning, the text was read. First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 12. Paul writes to Timothy. He says, you must lead by example. Let no one despise you of your youth. But for you not to be despised, show that you are mature enough. The problem we have is we look for leaders in our strategy. We have young, capable young people that are not proving by example that they are ready to lead. They want to lead by mouth, not by example. I always say to my son, I love you, but I don't like what you are doing. I love you, I'll always love you, but right now I don't like what you are doing. 
We have got young people capable, full of zeal and energy, but are not prepared at all to be exemplary. Then the adults become fearful of what will happen to the church. So the challenge is God is looking for you if you're under 30 years of old, under 30 years old. God is looking for you. Will you respond? I will go and be exemplary. We also learn very carefully there as we close that for strategy to succeed, it requires a long-term vision. It can't be about tomorrow. It can't be about six months. It has to have a long-term vision. I've always asked myself, so what is your strategy in life as a person? Okay? And you find that people do not have their own personal strategies. They only think about tomorrow and now. We were caught by COVID, most of us. We cried, we prayed. It's good, but you need to have a strategy. It must have a long-term vision. Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Given all that which I've showed you, follow me. I will make you what? Fishers of men. The fish that you're looking for in the ocean is no longer there. It's gone. In fact, Peter, the last fish that he caught was what he caught with Jesus. That was the last fish. From now on, you're going to catch what? That other fish out of water. Huh? That's the fish you're going to catch. And it's going to be for life. And as you learn to catch that fish, that's your pathway to heaven. Our vision in the work of God, we are saved by service. We are saved by service. In the Garden of Eden, God said before men fell, tender the garden. Now that you have fallen, go work and serve fellow men. Peter was being sent out of water onto the land. We need to learn that we need to actively work for God. Money is good. Donate money is good. It's good. We appreciate. But we need you. Because the focus is on you. As you practice to serve, to minister to others, you also refine your understanding of God in your life. You are able to testify of that which you have seen and felt. Not to listen to other people's testimonies. Go and save so they can testify. In fact, Luke says, we write of the things that we have seen and that we know. Yeah. What do you know? What have you seen? That's a strategic vision that Christ came on this chapter just for one man. And heaven is ready to open its strategy to you alone. Amen. You alone and no one else. The question is, what is your response? Let there be no excuse coming from your mouth that you can't serve. The fact that you are seated here today is evidence that you can go out and work for the Lord. Our heavenly first master then says to Peter, from henceforth you shall be a fisher of men. And I say to all of us today, as we unfold the strategy in the afternoon, we are going to learn how to catch a different kind of fish. And you are never alone. The master is always with us. He says, go ye therefore, and I will be with you always. Isn't it? Where sin abound, grace abound. There are times when we work for the master and we feel sin and see sin, but don't be despondent. Grace is abundant there. All you need to do is to call upon the master. I pray that God may bless the of his word. Amen. May the church rise with our last song, hymn 196.
that you had for us. Lord, may you please be with us today so that we learn not to make sin palatable, Lord. May you help us in our lives so that in everything we do, all praise, honor, and glory may be given to your name. May you help us so that we always look to you, even when it doesn't make sense, Lord. Bless us so that we keep our faith in you. Lord, may you please be with us and our hearts. Help us so that we do not harden them. May you please give us hearts of flesh so that we may remember your law and we may remember everything you do for us. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to thank God for the timely message that we received this afternoon and morning. May everyone please be reminded that we are going to be having lunch served 
so there is no need for us to go away and we are encouraged to come back at um, I think it's a 2 or 3 p.m. for the afternoon service where we're going to be going through this church strategy and at 5 p.m. we're going to be having the church business meeting so may we all please come back on our numbers for the church business meeting may we be blessed Uh, apologies, just one announcement that we forgot to mention during the morning. Uh, one of our members, um, Mrs. Chiguma, is not well. I think we are aware that she was not well a few weeks or so ago. But we want to let the church know that she is admitted at Brent Hess Hospital. And we are going to have a special prayer for her in the vestry. And if there is anybody else who wants a prayer for healing for themselves or for, for others that they know that they want to be included in this prayer, they can join us. So elders will have a prayer in the Vespers after, in the, in the Vestry after this service, middle after this. So if you want a prayer for the sick, you can join us. Uh, but let's remember the family uh, that we can also remember here in our prayers. Thank you. Hymn number 145. Two. Unga Two. Sous-titrage 
mintando ya mi wali wesumini